All right, we're going to call Transportation, Highways, Military Affairs meeting to order. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started with roll, please, Diana. Okay, Representative Berger. Excused. Excused. Representative Nemec. Here. Representative Obermuller. Here. Representative O'Hearn. Here. Representative Pendergraft. Here. Representative Smith. Here. Representative Stivar. Present. Representative Wiley. Here. Chairman Brown. Here. Thank you, Diana. So we're going to go ahead and continue House Bill 68 uh, brought over from Tuesday's meeting. Um, Representative Henderson, thank you for coming back. Sorry we weren't able to squeeze you in at the last minute there last time, but we want to make sure we give you due consideration. So we'll go ahead and turn it back over to you and uh, have you explain the impetus of the bill, if you would like, and then uh, we'll go from there. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, committee, for this opportunity to continue this important discussion. Uh, I bring you House Bill 68, School Zone Crosswalks. As I said before, this is a bill that's modeled after the, the legislation that we enacted a, a couple of years ago related to bus stops that were being violated. And there's been some improvement there. Uh, just to going through the bill very quickly, uh, page two, I, I would just mention, you know, we all have a shared responsibility and uh, particularly in, 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 the, in, the, in the right of way areas in, in crosswalks. Uh, it's already required for the vehicles to stop when someone's in a crosswalk. And this adds another layer of protection, if you will, but more importantly, it helps us to figure out what went wrong. What did we miss? How can we improve? How can we uh, prevent, you know, hopefully uh, more fatalities and, and injuries? I provided a, a handout to the committee. I distributed, as I said before, to the, to the chamber. And if you look at the front, just high to highlights, uh, urban rural comparison, 85% of the incidents are in urban areas and 15% are in, uh, in, in the rural areas. On the back, importantly, are uh, communities across our state where, where these unfortunate and in, in many cases tragic incidents have occurred. Please note that it's not just the urban areas with more population where these incidents occur. It's also not the areas where crosswalks are designated. Turn back to the front at the bottom, there is a nice bar chart that sets it out graphically for us. If you look at the green line, you know, over the last period, this goes from 2018 to 2022 information, 152 incidents in the roadway, not in the crosswalk or intersection. But just below that, the other big long line, the yellow one, is 120 happened in the crosswalk, and they were marked. And, uh, and uh, there are fatalities listed above there, unfortunately, uh, every year, every single year. You look over at the critical crashes, crashes, serious crashes. This information was provided our good folks at the Wyoming Department of Transport. Excuse me, can I say that here? Yeah, why not? Okay, why not? Uh, but, uh, I just highlight a couple of communities on the back. You know, Cody, Cheyenne, Casper, Jackson, Gemmer, Thermopolis, Wheatland. These are these are places where we live, where we where we go. And uh, so I think it's important to look constantly at ways to improve safety, particularly for our young people to and from school. But to remember. These pedestrians include everyone who is a pedestrian, including those in, in wheelchairs. I was uh, really amazed when, you know, we have a one way with two lanes and a good, a good, a good driver stops to allow pedestrian to cross. Someone else is in a hurry, comes around, doesn't, doesn't understand why they're stopped and they whip around and go on. We have marked school zones and uh, and so we, we start a bill, we start a conversation, and this is an important one, as, as you would agree, I'm sure. 
And then we want to think about how to implement it. Who's going to control it? Who's going to pay for these, these cameras? Those are all important questions, and they're, and they're asked every day in every one of our communities in a number of ways. So I have a, a couple of a pro proposed amendments that have been provided to me by the uh, suggested amendments provided by the uh, good folks at, at White Up. And uh, I don't know if you know, I've learned a lot about this in terms of how, how crosswalks are established. You know, they do a very sophisticated study, takes a period of time, sometimes up to a year, to complete the analysis, review the data, the pictures, they have cameras, they look at times of the day, different times of the day, and they establish whether a crosswalk would improve safety or perhaps go the other way. So these crosswalks aren't put willy-nilly everywhere. Oh, I didn't need a crosswalk there. No, these are very sophisticated procedures used by smart people and technology and equipment in our state to make sure we have these crosswalks. There's another bill I'll refer to. It's over in the, in the other chambers uh, addressing the money side of this. During the interim, this was a, a topic that was given good discussion by the Judiciary Committee. And uh, that's why I didn't include an appropriation in this one. Uh, but we aren't, we aren't through the signed budget yet. We don't get the budget till next week, so there's, there's time to put amendments in there. But uh, I would just go for an example to uh, page two, uh, lines four to, four to seven. We're talking about these devices. And, you know, someone might have a constitutional concern about, uh, you know, being, being photographed. Well, I invite, go and look at Converse and Dell Range. There's a camera, different type of deal, obviously. But I think every situation has to be dialed in with the essential pieces of information and good discussion like we're starting here and work through the process and developed properly, right? For the benefit of everyone particularly our young people. I mean, the other day coming in, I saw a young, young person run across Lincoln Way. And uh, so, and then back in October, we had a young child hit on second and central. Fortunately, the child didn't die. I think it's directly related to the enforcement, the additional support and enforcement and the speed trailers put up in the few weeks before that, before Halloween. So I think it's something that's it's so important. We cannot wait to have another fatality in one of our schools on crosswalks. I don't believe. I mean, if, 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 if we had a forest fire, we'd be about putting it out. Huh? If, we had, if we had the pandemic, we're about trying to solve a way to, 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 to defend against it. And so I think there's an information piece to this. And on the citation, I think going back to the uh, constitutional right to confront your accuser, it says you have a right to contest this. You schedule an appointment in court, you bring your evidence, and this is, provides evidence for the, for the resolution. But here's the thing that I'd ask you to consider, please. We don't know how many near misses we've had. How many times have people that we know or families that we were friends with had children in crosswalks that just that close, near miss. Uh, I've heard the, the incident on Central in October referred to as the, the pedestrian was nicked. He was hit. Huh? So I don't want to go too, too long, but uh, you know I know there's a lot of unanswered questions. I'd be glad to take your questions, and I look forward to the public comment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Committee, any questions for Representative Henderson on the bill? Okay, uh, Representative, I do have a few, um, and I'm actually looking one up as you were talking, trying to get through this, but I'll, I'll ask you as, as I'm listening to your answers on a few of these others. So my, my question is on this, pictures of the crosswalk. Um, my envisioning is we're going to take a snapshot in either direction of the crosswalk, and it's going to have the lane of travel, and you're going to have the picture of the vehicles going through it. How does this enforcement mechanism work to where we can prove that there was somebody in the crosswalk at the exact same time? And when would that camera um, then photograph, as opposed to being a rolling continuous cycle of film, um, how would we know that there was somebody in the crosswalk at the other end of the crosswalk? What, what are you envisioning with this? Because I feel like 
we have a potential issue here with snapping a picture, but we can't prove that there was anybody in that crosswalk. How, how do you envision that? Well, I'll start with the, with the you know, containing the, the scope of, of what you're talking about. It's only, it's only on during 7, 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. And it's only when school is in session. So there's a finite period. And it's only retained. Whatever's, whatever's obtained is only retained for one year and it's destroyed. And it's, it's not subject to the Public Records Act. So it's not open information like you'd go out and read a newspaper. But I think fundamentally it has to start with the, with the shared stakeholders who, who have a key role to play in this. And that would be, you know, I think the transportation department, I think the cities and towns, even the counties would have a say in this for coordination purposes. But also, I think it begins fundamentally with the one proposed amendment I have here on page four, line eight. I insert the department may promulgate rules and regulations related to the enforcement of this section in consultation. Keyword, consultation. I might suggest adding coordination for implementation with the state superintendent of public construction. And that links it to the important hierarchy that we have in place now for our policy to be disseminated throughout the state via the department and the, uh, and the school boards down to the district level. The other piece here that, that's important is the opportunity for the public to weigh in, for the public to have an opportunity to participate in our rulemaking process, which is required, right? We don't wanna make this policy in isolation of input from our, from our, our good people in the public. So that's how I endorse it. And, and, and then it's an on, it, the other piece here is the, is the law enforcement piece. Please know, as I said, I alluded to on the floor just a little while ago, I support law enforcement. They do a fantastic job under difficult circumstances every day, right? And I think we ought to support that by giving them some tools. Uh, I recently had a conversation with a local police officer who asked, indicated an interest in obtaining, you know, technology that would help them identify license plates. That, Mr. Chairman, is one way. Also asked for information that would help them identify vehicles and people in different situations. And we have that in certain areas to a degree. But in this case, you know, the concern was mentioned by the vice chairman last time about indications of concern be having been photographed. It's like when you put up security cameras, you don't want to face them at your neighbor's house. That's not the point of it, right? And so these can, these can be placed so that only the area that needs to be monitored is displayed and rec recorded and displayed on, on the video. There's no voice, there's no audio. We're not interested in conversations, those kind of things. We're interested in, was this a situation where the pedestrian had the right of way in the crosswalk? And importantly, did the vehicle stop? Was the vehicle going the right speed? I mean, we have to start somewhere. Right now, we don't have that. We don't have a way to know. Unless, I mean, even in the case of cross, cross, what do you, uh, uh, crossing guards, uh, you know, they, they're distracted. They're trying to watch, I don't know, one to 10 or 15 or more students going across the crosswalk, plus the traffic and so on. There's a lot of stuff. This gives them a, a reinforcement to a support tool, right? It's like when you go into a dark room, you turn the light on. Right? And so we have several situations. Down south here, we have a parkway. Representative, I, I appreciate your yeah, I'm, I'm Yeah, thank you. I'm getting I, off, but we, we've got a lot of bills on the docket. Yeah, yeah, so I yeah. want to get through some other questions, but Representative Obermuller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just need to be clear. How does this bill stop a person from running into a child in a crosswalk? It doesn't, no more than a, than a red. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Representative Chairman. Henderson, thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. It doesn't no more than a, than a, than a uh, you know a, a, a red light stops a stops a vehicle from entering an intersection, right? Okay. Follow up, Mr. Follow Chairman. up. So this bill it really is about enforcement and catching people that have hit children. It's not about saving lives, really. Is well, that true, Representative Henderson? To me, it's about adding another layer of safety support. I mean. We have a lot of incidents, you know, remember the analysis I talked about in terms of deciding where to put the crosswalk. 
they do similar studies and analysis on where to put the, the stop sign, the traffic control things that we have, where to put the street lights, where to put the, how, what kind of marking, you know, we had bike lanes, those kind of things. So I think it's more about safety. Any other questions? Representative Stubber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On the sixth, uh, the sixth amendment, uh, the, uh, the confrontation clause being, uh, uh, to go against your accuser. How does this going to affect that? Representative Henderson. I don't understand the question. Representative Steyer, can you rephrase? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The sixth amendment of the constitution that you have a right to confront your accuser. Yeah. How is it, how does that going to affect the, the individual's right to confront their accuser? Well, Mr. Chairman. Representative Henderson. That's a good question. I, I tried to answer it earlier when I said that, you know, the constitutional right to confront your accuser, you have on your citation the right to contest. And so you have a right to go to court, have your day in court to do, to do your, to do your, bring your evidence and make your case. I mean, I, Representative Henderson, I, I think what the representative is trying to get to is it's in our constitutional constitution, it's, it's the burden of proof lies on the, uh, the government to prove your guilt, not for you to prove your innocence. Oh, yeah. And so I think what the representative is trying to bring forward is if there was nobody in the crosswalk per se, and we're relying on a picture who is there, once that enforcement goes forward and somebody comes to defend themselves, who is their accuser? Is their accuser the attorney general? Is their accuser the officer that's issued the citation that was not there? How does that work in a constitutional basis? Well, I mean, who's the, Mr. Chairman, who's the accuser in the situation where we enacted the law a couple of years ago for the bus stops, to stop buses that were being violated? Who's, who's the accuser in, in a situation where a prosecution is made for whatever reason? The evidence speaks for itself. And, and I think everyone has the right to due process and an opportunity to, to have their, their position heard uh, or not. Okay, Representative, I would just, I would counter that, that with the bus driving, um, and that was something that I worked on personally, uh, we utilized the bus driver as, as the backstop um, for the, the person, you know, being charged. They are typically seen as the witness. And so if we are worrying about this, and this is some of the questions that I've had as well um, on this particular bill, if we're just relying on a camera and there was nobody there, um, and the crosswalk goes off. If these are all school zone crosswalks, we would hope that there would be somebody there. But if this is an issue that's brought forward, um, you know, again, it's it's incumbent upon the state to prove guilt, not for the individual to prove their innocence. Um, I do want to ask you another question, and I'm I'm confused by the language. If you might be able to help me out, on page two, um, lines one and two say the following shall apply to crosswalks and school zones, and then we have a very permissive. The school zone control traffic control devices located in school marked zones may be equipped with a video system. So if it's the intent of your bill that we require these video systems to be in place, those two seem to be um, in conflict with one another. And I'm just curious if that was unintentional or if there was a reason why there is a permissive language underneath a uh, shall clause. Well, I think the permissive language speaks for itself. Uh, I think the first line is a matter of context in terms of specifying what this applies to, the extent to which is the committee's pleasure and the legislature determine how, how it ends up. Uh, but if I may, Mr. Chairman, just go back to the previous question briefly. Please. Uh, you know who was there in addition to the driver of the vehicle? The pedestrian and maybe other pedestrians. And maybe in the case of children, maybe there was a relative or a family member or a neighbor who was helping them get to and from school. There also may have been other witnesses who saw it happen. I don't have a crystal ball. I can't predict every situation. But I can say with reasonable certainty that if we have a way to detect those situations where we might have inadvertently, I don't say we want to deliberately have near misses. I don't say that we want the drivers intentionally drive down the street the schools only want to hit somebody but we want to have a way to detect it and maybe there's a need for additional lighting maybe there's a, a need for for those 
those signs that they pushed for the you know when they crossed the crosswalk there's more visibility you know with it with the uh, warning warning drivers that someone's in the crosswalk like in our traffic circle certainly uh, representative a couple more questions that i have uh, is there any other questions from the committee i kind of hogging up here but i want to make sure if there's any questions from the committee that they're answered as well okay um representative looking at this who would issue the citation underneath your current legislation is this an officer that would be dedicated to this is this local law enforcement is this the state uh, highway patrol that would issue the citation um, who, who would end up having that authorization to to file the citation upon receiving this information go ahead mr chairman thank you that's a very good question right and it goes to the enforcement of the law piece that was referred to earlier I think it's going to be a function of the results of the process of developing the rule. And it's also going to be a function of the school district and the jurisdiction and existing laws in place. That's the importance of involving the public in developing that rule, I think, because we all have different customs in our in our different communities in terms of, you know, how the traffic patterns are and so forth. So uh, I'm going to defer to the people that know how to enforce the law to, to, to give you the best answer on that. Chairman. Okay. Uh, and then lastly, on that same line of questioning, who would ultimately be um, the plaintiff if if we're, or I'm sorry, not the, the plaintiff that would ultimately end up if somebody brought forward their case and um, they were in the case that you was you decided that you ran a crosswalk, your picture was taken, you go in front of the the judge, who then represents the state, the local authority, who who's going to be in charge of defending? Um, the state's position that you did indeed, did indeed break the law? Well, I think that's a function of our process in terms of how we how we finalize this this legislation, this important legislation. My my uh, my initial thought on that is that we already have a lot of that done in various areas in terms of law enforcement. Uh, as far as uh, the plaintiff, you know, there there is word, there's language in this relative to the, you know, it's not a moving violation and and that would, that would tend to shape the nature of the response to the question you're asking. But in terms of who would, who would take care of that, I think that would have to be determined by the, uh, by the folks of, you know, in the communities that, that set up the municipal ordinances, maybe in the state, through our, you know, through our law enforcement people, the good folks who were here before. And then my last question uh, for you, Representative, is when we look at who this bill ultimately tasks we are tasking the state wyoming department of transportation to enforce and to create promulgation of rules regarding all crosswalks in the entire state and i'm a little concerned with that because i, I get to the point of what does this ultimately look like for who pays for the bill right who, who foots the bill for if somebody wants to put these traffic control devices up um, is this the state that's going to be funding this? Is this going to be the local school district that says, hey, I would like these, and the Department of Transportation says, okay, well, you got to pony up the money. Is this the local jurisdiction for the city or the county? We, we have kind of this separation of um, who ultimately is going to be in charge of this, but the implementation, I think, is where I'm, I'm not quite understanding. Mr. Chairman, Please. thank you. So to be clear, you're, you're, you're focusing on, on the pay, pay for piece? Well, you notice that I don't have a section in here on appropriation. As I said, I'm, I'm looking and supporting the, uh, the bill coming across. One of the reasons that I suggest that YDOT start this is they, is they have better experience, I believe, across the state in terms of interfacing with communities with existing conditions, existing circumstances of enforcement and pay for as far as signage. Right. And then there's a lot of cross jurisdictional situation, state, city, county. And so the pay for piece is important. And uh, I, I'm not. Uh, I mean, even if the even if the rulemaking process came out and this was modified, that we had a pilot program like we do in a lot of places. One of the important things that we need to have is information. And, and how this is going to be covered is important information. And the pay for piece of that is very important. Pay for and maintenance. And uh, so I suggest that we have, we have options. We have options now. I'll, I'll uh, 
look for testimony to that effect. Uh, and then we have possibilities that we can do as we go forward. Okay. Uh, Representative Obermuller, you have another question? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So in your testimony earlier, you said that one of the safety functions is that we would I'd be identifying problems within crosswalks. I'm wondering if that process couldn't happen without the cameras uh, in, in relation to what standards are regarding what crosswalks would look like. Uh -huh. Do those kind of standards currently exist yeah. that you know of uh -huh. on how crosswalks should be built, uh -huh. the safety features of those crosswalks to the maximum safety of children? Representative Henderson. Well, that's a lot to unpack, but I'm going to start with uh, the word no, no. I know since I started looking at this, I've learned a lot about who in our state is involved most of their working life in these key areas, uh, the traffic administration, traffic enforcement, city management, county management, and so forth. And so in terms of uh, the, the, uh, the assessment piece and, and the safety improvement, I would refer us to consider what they call a safe route to school plan. And we have these across the state. Cheyenne has one. You know, the last time it was, it was updated, 2010. Much of it's still, still pertinent, but you know, we've changed a lot since 2010. And so the good folks are looking at that education, school districts, the city, the county, the Department of Transportation. There's a lot of key players in this that have to come together and interface with each other so that we don't make more problems instead of solve them. And so I think what comes out of that is situations like that, that incident on Central that I talked about. You know, the record shows that in the last 10 years there's been one crosswalk incident on Central Avenue in Cheyenne, Wyoming. There's no record to indicate how many people have been almost hit. There's no record to indicate how many times people have been at the light at 8th and, and uh, Central. When the light turned green, they take off racing down Central with no regard, really, right? No, and, and, you know, it takes time to stop. It takes time to stop. We, we have a, that constituent who was T-boned on Converse, and the person who T-boned her had 100 feet of skid mark on a city street. So I'm going to suggest that person's going pretty fast. And so if we have a way to, 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 to record or to document these incidents, then within that period that, that, it's, that the information is available, I'm going to count on the good folks that are looking at it and have, have, have that available. They're going to look at, hey, this is something we ought to look into more. We ought to look closer at this. Maybe it's a lighting issue. Maybe it's the color of the, of the crosswalk. Maybe it's the signage. I don't know. It could be a number of things. And I think this provides a mechanism to support that. Thank you, Representative. You're good. Okay. Any further questions? All right, Representative Henderson, thank you so much for all your information. I'm going to bring up uh, Mr. Rossetti from the Department of Transportation and anybody he wishes to bring along. I see maybe a few others that might be joining. So thank you, sir. Mr. Rossetti, if you'd please introduce yourself and anybody else you're having tag along. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Taylor Rossetti, Support Services Administrator. Uh, the director regrets not being here. He had a other commitment. With me, I have uh, Mr. Joel Mina. He is the state traffic engineer uh, and what I would consider our, our crosswalk expert. So I, I think I, I'd like to start, I think, from, from uh, just sort of a policy perspective. And, and you guys are the policy makers here, Mr. Chairman. And anything I say shouldn't be viewed as me trying to take a stance on things. I'm, I'm simply trying to react and listen to the testimony as it was presented and trying to understand what the intent of the bill was. So I, I think that sort of takes me down a couple of different paths. And I think some of the questions that I hear um, out of the committee really kind of illustrates what those paths are. And I think the, the highest level um, path that is probably uh, one of the most difficult, I think, for us to wrap our heads around here in, in Wyoming and, and just as citizens is that idea of the automated enforcement. And, and that's really where, um, 
you know, the, the equipment may actually take that picture of me as I do this violation. And that's actually the only thing that happens. There's no human intervention. That ticket or a vendor actually is the one who issues the citation. And, and that, is, that is a path we could go down. Um, that's not sitting here in this bill, but, but that is a path that could be gone down. I think the, the other thing that's a little bit um, more something that we can start to wrap our heads around is, and it's been brought up today, is, is how we handle the school bus passing and how that enforcement action works. And I did talk to a, a school district here in Wyoming and their process is much like the chairman mentioned. I'm driving the bus, Joel passes me, I indicate that when I go back to the bus barn, somebody in the bus barn reviews that, yep, okay, we've got what we need. They package that information up and submit a form to their local law enforcement. Then law enforcement actually uses that as the evidence. They issue the ticket and that's where you get to your facing your accuser question. That, that's, that's how we've gotten to that issue in the school bus zones. So I think that's more of a middle of the road thing that's probably a solution that would potentially be more tailored toward dealing with this solution, which is again, very narrow in scope and that that language that you pointed out there on the top of page two mr chairman when you're talking about the differences i think in tense between shall and may i believe that um the representative did did answer that in, in a very appropriate way and i think what it's saying is and again this is your decision to make if the legislature would like to stipulate that this shall apply to crosswalks in school zones that means it only applies in the school zones. So anywhere else in the municipal boundary or in the county where a crosswalk is, I think would be excluded from the provisions below there. So that's narrowly scoping this into your school zones. And then I think you get down to that may then on line five. And I, and I do believe that's where then, if the jurisdictions involved want to do this, within those school zones, they may do this. So, so I, do, I do think that's how I would reconcile those, those two differences there. I think a little bit a little bit further, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I do think as an agency that's involved in in public safety at, at all levels and, and pedestrian safety of vulnerable users is certainly of utmost importance to us at YDOT. And I think to the question of of why this might be set up for us to potentially promulgate rules and regulations is, is I, I think as state agencies we're generally afforded that. And I think through that process, what we would envision is probably involving uh, WAM and WCCA and, and their representatives, right? Because really this is a, is a local jurisdictional question and it, it's really a solution that I think has to be made at that level, as well as the state superintendent of public instruction, because then I think they can have, bring in the perspective of the statewide schools and, and how they would potentially want to handle that. So I, I think that's why we got brought into this. I, I, I do, believe that again uh, the gentleman sitting to the right of me is is what i would consider a traffic and, and crosswalk expert so i think we can bring that that global perspective but I, I think it's important that the municipalities and the counties be intimately involved in that rule so that we make sure this this fits fits what they ultimately envision i think real quick too from a perspective of of why that also might be weird and why you might have asked the question chairman brown is when we look at this, we have 48 school zones on the state system. That's, that's the state system on roadways that we manage. Now, some of those may have multiple crosswalks, but those are school zones. We estimate there's at least three times as many that are off the system. And I think all of you know that. As you drive through your communities, you know that a lot of these school zone crosswalks are not on the state system. But again, I think is if, if this were to pass and we want to go to rulemaking, that's why I suggest we have all of the parties at the table as we move forward. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, I certainly, I can, I can stop there um, depending on what you guys would like to do. And I, I believe that, that Mr. Mina can probably answer questions about what equipment might look like, how that might perform. Um, and I'd end with that, sir. Committee, any questions for Mr. Rossetti? Seeing none, Mr. Mina, do you have anything to add? Nothing? <laughs> no, Mr. Chairman. Okay, um, I do have a question for you and it's very, very similar in nature um, to, to what I asked the, the representative as far as when we look at the, and I appreciate the, um, 
Mr. Rossetti bringing this up, we, we authorize the vendor, from my understanding at this point, to issue the citation. Um, and that is not included in this language. So with something like that, based off of this, and either one of you might be able to answer this, is that something we need to include? Uh, because as it stands right now, I don't see any authorization as to who's going to issue this um, and ultimately who, who would have that authority. Um, Mr. Chairman, I believe as the bill is set up now, it, it, it does not contemplate that automated enforcement through the vendor. I, I do think that that would be needed and would likely be a substantial um, policy shift um, from the body. And are all the MENA brothers engineers? Right. <laughs> yes, <kidding>. Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I used to work with Jeff, so. <laughs> all right. Oh, Mr. Obermuller, Representative Obermuller. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So can you describe to us, Mr. Rossetti, the, how the department looks at this bill and uh, cameras and school zones in the broader context of safety of our kids? Mr. Rossetti. Mr. Chairman and, and Representative Obermuller, thanks for giving me an easy one. Uh, I, I, I do believe that, that what this potentially does afford us is, is the ability to document some of those things that are not readily um, reported now. Um, I believe the representative went down the line of the near misses. Um, quite frankly, there's probably even instances where, where an individual might be struck um, that, that didn't get reported. So, so I think what, what, what cameras in those zones might do is, was provide the evidence and the documentation to really understand what the scope of this problem truly is. Um, I, I also believe that, that one of the things that we look at typically at YDOT, and this is, this is where Mr. Mina would definitely be able to step in, but we, we look at what the likelihood is of incidences based on you know, how many people are in the crosswalks, how many tra cars travel down the road. But again, you pair that back with, as Representative Henderson mentioned, some of these instances do happen in those rural areas where the math doesn't seem to, at, the, at first sight, you know, make sense. So I do believe that what this bill does, Representative Overmuller, is it sets up the ability to have that monitoring on those crosswalks. I think as it is set up now, I think the mechanism of enforcement is a bit murky and would require a little bit of work um, probably between uh, us and the committee and the sponsor to get there. Um, but but it, it does allow for then the monitoring and the use of that as evidence in a proceeding. So I think that's what it does. Representative Stibar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, if you look at 1305 in the statutes, under D, a person charged with a violation may be given his promise to parent court by accepting at least one copy of a written traffic citation prepared by an officer. So, Is there, how is that going to work, sir? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Rosetti, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Stivar. Um, I, I, I do believe, again, I, I go back to the way that um, some of the counties and the school districts are running that school bus program. That ticket is actually written by the officer, and I believe that that is exactly how this has worked in practice. Follow up. Follow up? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Follow up. Yeah, but the officer, but you've been talking about a third party vendor issuing tickets in this bill. That's my understanding. So how is this going to work? We cannot have a third party vendor. It has Mr. to be Resident. an officer, correct? Uh, Mr. Chairman and Representative Stivar, um, I apologize if I was unclear. Um, I, I think the, the third party vendor is, is potentially a pathway could go down. I believe the more middle of the road solution would be to try to tailor this to be more similar to the way the school bus cameras work which takes the vendor out of the, the equation. And what it relies on is, is probably somebody monitoring that traffic device. And then that information being sent to a law enforcement officer who then would issue the ticket. All right. Um, I do have one question for you, Mr. Mina. Um, do you currently work with school districts and or local municipalities right now in crosswalk development? 
Um, is that something your office currently does, or is this be something that would stretch out and, and expand your scope of what you're currently doing? Uh, on the highway system, Mr. Chairman, we do. And we get requests from locals to put more in, local governments. And we do go through our criteria and our warrants. We do, we do that quite a bit. Any further questions? Seeing none. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll go ahead and open up this for public comment. Oh, I do have some elected representatives. Is there any elected representatives that would like to speak on this bill? Representative Hornock, please. Thank you. Well, we're on that one. <laughs> Representative Hornock, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll, I'll try to be brief, but uh, I just want it, to, it, it's been hit on by this committee and um, it seems like when there's a hole in the fence in a field, all the cows can find it. And so I think what happens with this bill is we're kind of letting in something that I, I don't think is intended, but it will go down this road. And I, I think it's very, uh, it's, it's not a road we wanna go down. Um, now, something was mentioned uh, earlier uh, you, you know, it's a it's a incredibly sad situation when I don't want to be the parent to lose a child in a crosswalk. Uh, so we're all on board with that. We all agree with that. We all agree how difficult that would be. Um, but it was mentioned that that there's an education piece that needs to be had, and I think that is important in all of this. However, I think there's other factors that go into. Um, what you're looking at. Uh, there's, there's a lot of other factors with the constitutionality, the right of due process, things that this body has, has talked about, has hit on. And I, I think we need to be very careful to, that all the cows aren't going to get out there because once we start down this road where, um, you know, in, in this bill, uh, it, from the way I read it, it's a rolling video from seven o'clock to four o'clock in the afternoon, um, most of that time, kids aren't anywhere to be seen. They're they're in school, but that video is still rolling, and and it could, it it will catch somebody that's uh, going one mile an hour over through that zone, um, whatever that is. I mean, there's there's some there's some issues with that, and then uh, it does. Uh, tag a person based on their license plate. So as a, as a guy with a couple company vehicles, I could have an employee driving in that vehicle. I'm gonna be tagged for that um, citation or the company is gonna be tagged for a citation. There's not really a way to specify who's in the vehicle. Um, you know, it, it, it kind of runs into a gray area where, um, you know, how do you, uh, how do you specifically target the person that's guilty? And so, uh, granted, hey, if somebody's guilty, let's let's prosecute. Um, but there's a lot of other factors that go into incidences in crosswalks as well. I mean, uh, just for instance, um, I can think of last year, right after the time change, hearing about two incidences in crosswalks because you go back into darkness and people aren't used to that. And right after that time period, there was a couple, uh, you know, I, I don't remember the, the scope of the tragedy, but, but you know, things that happened in, in crosswalks. So, so there's a lot of other factors, distracted driving, um, impairment, whatever that, that is, it's so, it's difficult to, to kind of hone in on, on exactly what that is. But, but we're going down a difficult, a path that I would, suggest is is uh, stepping on the border or potentially crossing the fence to uh, getting to a place where we're we're violating people's constitutional rights so uh, just with that i'll stand for any questions if there are any thanks thank you representative any questions for representative hordock seeing none thank you so thank much you. and i do not see any other elected representatives so Tony i will open this oh tony you're not not talking. Okay. Uh, anybody else from the public? We'll open this up for public comment. Uh, Mr. Winnie. 
please introduce yourself. Please come on up. Feel free to go ahead and fill the chairs, and we'll just take you one right after the next. If you're interested in doing public comment, just go ahead, and when one person gets up, fill the next chair, please. Mr. Chairman, Bill Winnie, Sublet County. I've seen the legislature go around the block on children and school buses, or in this case, crosswalk several times. Um, serious, serious issue. Uh, if I could speak to Representative Stivar's concerns for a moment, having been stationed in the uh, Washington, D.C. and Norfolk, Virginia area several times in my career, Virginia went down the path of stoplight cameras only to have them declared uh, unusable in court unless there was a person present that could uh, speak to what was on the camera which is, I believe is exactly what Representative Stiver is getting at. And so they were unusable in court in that system in Virginia. Uh, but there is a way you could solve that. You could have volunteer crossing guards that have a handheld stop sign, much as we see similar with uh, construction zones, YDOT construction zones and so on. And if they were there, saw it, camera evidence, you have the person. So the other thing is that in conversation with uh, our uh, Wyoming uh, state troopers, uh, they have remarked to me that a private person can go to a trooper and uh, describe a uh, violation, and the trooper can issue a citation based on that, but the person has to show up in court to back up the violation. The trooper is merely handling the piece of paper and he's the 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 uh, officer that authorized to sign such a piece of paper so there's a couple ways around the process you're looking at but the other the real issue here is children do unpredictable things and in crosswalks or school buses or whatever you just don't know how they're going to react and you want people to slow down well how can you do that well first off it's a school zone so they ought to be slow already, like 15 or 20 miles an hour. You could come up with something like speed dependent stoplights, where if somebody comes into the school zone over the speed limit, the stoplight goes red. Those have worked well, I understand, in, in uh, other uh, states. Uh, so there's some ways around to get to what Representative Henderson wants to do. And the concerns about the Constitution issues, I think, are valid, but there are workarounds. Subject to your questions, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Winnie? Thank you, Mr. Winnie. Ms. Hyde, please introduce yourself, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Kathy Hyde, and I live in Casper. I'd like to say that my heart has great compassion for the mother who spoke of the loss of her son, Mac Evans a couple days ago in the crosswalk accident. And I know that she's in support of House Bill 68, but despite this terrible tragedy, there are an overwhelming number of reasons to oppose House Bill 68 in the implementation of automated video systems, including constitutional violations, surveillance issues, and corruption. I'd like to discuss the definition of what an automated vehicle identification is. These vehicle identification video systems are high-speed, computer-controlled camera systems that automatically capture all license plate numbers that come into view along with the location, date, and time. The data, which includes photographs of the vehicle, its driver, and its passengers, is then uploaded into a central server. The information that is collected can be used by police to not only detect a traffic violation, but to identify travel patterns where the plate has been in the past, and even to discover vehicles that may be associated with each other. License plate data can not only put together an intimate portrait of a driver, but can also be used to target drivers who visit sensitive places, such as churches, private residences, and political events, and more. Advocates for this bill argue it is for the safety of the children and to stop violations within the school zone crosswalks. But if this were truly about the safety of children, crosswalk guards would be in greater attendance, speed bumps and flashing lights would be installed, and police officers would be there using their radar in these locations to ticket offenders more frequently. 
Statistics show that driver and student distraction is a major contributor to crosswalk accidents, something that a video camera cannot prevent. House Bill 68 allows images of the vehicle, driver, and license plate to be collected by the identification system. This data that is collected on innocent drivers as well as violators. Innocent drivers are not capable of opting out of this surveillance system. Even worse, on page two, lines 20 and 21, it states that the images may be used for discovering other criminal actions. So even though this bill outlines that the identification videos are used for identifying school zone crosswalk violations, they may in fact be used for identifying other violations outside of the bill's original intent. As to another concern, House Bill 68 states that the data, which includes innocent drivers, is only to be held for one year. But this is a moot point, as once the data is originally collected, it is stored and held for years in databases and fusion centers throughout the region. And this includes the Wyoming Fusion Center that is located right here in Cheyenne. The center states on its website that it works with the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI. The surveillance data that is gathered is unquestionably provided to DHS, and I have a document which reflects that. For years, DHS has been a huge source for the subsidization of these automated cameras for years. The U.S. Department of Justice awarded a grant for one of these surveillance machines to the Cheyenne Police Department several years ago. In a comprehensive report by the American Civil Liberties Union, they cited the role that DHS has played in providing billions of dollars in grants to surveillance system manufacturers. The data that's collected on all drivers is also maintained by private companies, such as the license plate reader vendors, insurers, and regional sharing systems. Again, this is information that's collected on all drivers, innocent as well as violators. Vigilant Solutions, which is one of the largest private vendors of data and scanners, boasted many years ago that it had hundreds of millions of plate scans in its commercial database. I would surmise that this number is in the billions by now. In addition to these gross examples of privacy violations, I would like to mention the unconstitutionality of this bill's language in terms of due process, or rather lack of due process. The language in this bill allows law enforcement to ticket the registered owner of a vehicle identified by the video and fine them regardless of the driver of the vehicle. The language states on page three that it shall be a defense if the driver provides proof that he was not the person operating the vehicle at the time of the violation, or if the driver provides proof that he was not the current owner of the vehicle at the time of the violation. But this language clearly violates the Fifth Amendment of our U.S. Constitution by placing the burden of proof on the innocent. The burden of proof should be on the accuser and not placed upon the owner of the vehicle to prove that he was not operating the vehicle or was not the current owner. In addition, this bill violates the Sixth Amendment that gives the accused a right to be confronted by a witness against him, which in this case should be a police officer ticketing him. And I, do, I did notice that Representative Henderson mentioned a camera at Dell Range, but this camera is also unconstitutional. Lastly, the corruption that's been associated with these license plate scanner machines is astounding. Overwhelming instances of bribery and fraud have been proven with convictions in numerous states. Many of these have involved government officials and private automated surveillance machine corporations. As they say, follow the money. The revenue generation these systems provide to local government pocketbooks is of no small amount. To sum up, the evidence is indisputable that vehicle identification systems perform mass data collection on innocent people. They violate numerous individual rights defended in our U.S. Constitution and invite corruption into local and state governments. Every problem has more than one solution. 
If Wyoming had passed House Bill 186 that was proposed in 2021, which would have prohibited automated vehicle surveillance systems, parents and law enforcement would certainly have found different and effective ways to implement safety measures in crosswalks. There are better ways to protect our children and automated ticketing machines are not the answer. I would ask that you would vote no on House Bill 68. Thank, thank you, you. Ms. Ide. Any questions for Ms. Ide? Seeing none, thank you so much. Thank you. Any further public testimony? Mr. Mayor, please. Please introduce yourself for the record and the floor is yours. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm very concerned about the volume of traffic and speeds. Uh, going Mr. Mayor, can I have you introduce yourself? I apologize, for the record, please. I'm Mayor Patrick Collins from Cheyenne. And I am concerned with the volume and speed of traffic going through our school zones. Our police department, every morning, we send every officer we have out to uh, school zones every afternoon. That's where they're, they're located. We have a lot more school zones than we have police officers. We have so many close calls, children getting hit, and we have the tragedy that you, know, you guys are aware of. The use of this technology, I believe, is like a force multiplier for our, our, our department, allowing the, the, the officers to be there when, uh, when they're not available actually in that location. So personally, I would appreciate the ability to use uh, this tool in some of our most dangerous and busy crosswalks. If it's successful in lowering speeds, um, making people aware, um, maybe we would expand it into other areas. Uh, it would allow us to be able to study the issues and understand it a little bit more. And so I would appreciate your understanding and support of this bill. Thank you. Any questions for Mayor Collins? Seeing none, thank you so much. Thank you. Any further public testimony on House Bill 68? Going once. I do have online as well, so twice in the room. Oh, I've got one more coming up. Welcome. Please introduce yourself to the committee for the record, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Jesse Rubino, and I'm speaking on behalf of the State Freedom Caucus Network. Um, the network is standing in opposition to this bill, and as a former teacher, I understand the importance of keeping our kids safe when crossing the street and going into our schools. Um, I believe it's a proper role of government to make sure that our crosswalks are safe for students, but we need to make sure we do it in a way that is constitutional and that is effective. Um, so really quickly, I thought I would discuss um, some of the constitutional concerns. I won't belabor them. They've already been discussed at depth. Um, the, the first concern I'd like to bring up is the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment protects against unreasonable searches and seizures. And when it was adopted, the, the drafters of the Bill of Rights likely did not imagine that we would have digital surveillance um, as we do today. However, um, I think that our founders would roll over in their graves if they knew that we would be considering having a constant several hours long surveillance on innocent individuals with no prior determination or assumption that they had committed something wrong. Um, civil rights organizations on the left and right, including the ACLU, have raised issues about the constitutionality of warrantless surveillance. And um, just recently in 2018, the U.S. Supreme Court recognized that individuals have an expectation of privacy in the whole of their physical movements, which would include driving to and from work through a school zone. The Fifth Amendment was brought up by a previous speaker. Um, the, the way I explain it to my students is the government can't take your stuff or your money or your freedom without going through the proper procedures. And finding the owner of a vehicle, as it was previously discussed, with no assurances that the owner was the actual driver, presents serious due process concerns. The Sixth Amendment was already discussed. I won't belabor that. Um, and finally, I'd just like to comment on, on the safety concerns. Um, over a 12-year period in Houston, Texas, um, there was a study looking at the effectiveness and efficacy of red light cameras there. Now, I know we're not talking about red light cameras. We're talking about crosswalk cameras. but. Um, there was no reduction in the total number of accidents or injuries over a 12 year period at a specific um, at, at several intersections in Houston, Texas. Um, so if we're looking at efficacy of these of these systems, it doesn't appear as though they, they reduce driver speed or um, the occurrence of, of crashes. In fact, in, in some studies that I have read, they actually increase the number of crashes of, of rear end accidents and things like this when people realize that they're being recorded. Um, I would suggest to the committee to, to maybe examine alternative solutions to this problem that are proven. Um, 
The good bringer of the bill mentioned the button triggered traffic lights. Those have been proven to reduce incidents of, of accidents at crosswalks. Um, speed bumps are also very, very effective in reducing speed. Um, traffic guards, I know it's difficult to get people to come out and volunteer, but traffic guards are also a proven way to, to reduce these accidents. Um, so with that, those are the those are the, the whole of my testimony and I'll stand for questions. Thank you, Ms. Rubino. Any questions? Mr. Sm Representative Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Rubino, what are your thoughts on those crossing guards wearing body cameras and allowing the schools to invest in wearing a body camera during their times out there? Ms. Rubino. Representative Chairman, um, I mean, Mr. Chairman, Representative Smith, um, I, would, I would say that the, the body cameras would not present the same level of, of concerns as the unmanned um, cameras that would be placed on, on traffic poles or however they might be placed. Um, we know that body cameras are able to be used to introduce evidence into court when they're worn by police officers. And so I don't think that that would pose nearly the same level of concerns as unmanned cameras. Any further questions? Thank you, Ms. Rubino, Thank appreciate you. it. All right, uh, let's go ahead and go online. Go ahead, I believe I lost my piece of paper. I know we have somebody. Um, looks like Mr. Dow. Mr. Dow, if you would please go ahead and unmute yourself and turn on your camera as soon as you're in the room. Start video. There we go. Mr. Dow, welcome. Please introduce yourself and the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Sean Dow. Since 2008, I've been fighting against automated ticketing machines, and I'd like to clear up some misconceptions that you all might have. There is no photograph ever. It is 24 hour video surveillance. Every vehicle that drives by it, it uses a system called ALPR, Advanced License Plate Recognition. A background check is done on all vehicles that pass by. That information is then shared with the Department of Homeland Security, the municipality, as well as several other organizations, including NLETS and uh, loan officers, bounty hunters, law enforcement agencies, and there is no warrant, no probable cause. This is why 16 states have stopped using these automated ticketing machines and have banned them through the legislature. There have, by passing this bill, you will be instantly opening your taxpayers up to paying large amounts of lawsuits like the one recently issued in New Orleans where the judge issued into the city of New Orleans to refund $28 million in tickets. Every ticket that was ever issued in Minnesota and Wisconsin had to be refunded because they violate the Constitution. They violate your Fourth Amendment, your Fifth Amendment, your Sixth Amendment, your Seventh Amendment, and your Fourteenth Amendment to the Constitution. This is why these states have stopped using them. I would suggest that you learn from your, your colleagues in the other states' mistakes and just vote this out now and don't open this up. You need to keep law enforcement into the hands of sworn peace officers of Wyoming and not turn it over to a private foreign corporation who polices for profit. You should be ashamed of yourself for violating this bill. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Dow? All right, thank you, Mr. Dow. Appreciate your time today. We're gonna to go ahead and close public comments, seeing nobody rushing else up to the microphone or online. Um, committee, we've heard a lot of testimony today, uh, unconstitutionality, stuff like that. I, I normally would have the chairman's prerogative to go ahead and pull this, but I would like to um, offer this up to the committee. If there's anybody who would wish to move this forward, I'll, I'll go ahead and consider any motions at this point. All right, seeing no motions, I am going to table this indefinitely on my table as chairman prerogative. Thank you for everyone. Uh, YDOT, thank you so much for being here. All right, we have up next. Bear with me as I'm getting to it. Uh, 158, and I do not see representative um larson here so i will actually go ahead and we will move into house bill 160 and i'll shoot representative henderson a text message he's probably sitting in appropriations at another meeting so or larson sorry representative pendergraft thank you so much the floor is yours 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If the floor is mine, am I responsible for cleaning it? I'm just trying to. Thank you. Sorry. <clears throat> this should be a very quick, easy bill, as it was kind of a an idea spawned right here in this room. As a soldier, many times you want to partake in some sort of an organization or different benefits and they ask you to prove that you are indeed a veteran. And the traditional way of doing that is to go back to your gun safe or wherever you keep your DD-214, drag that thing out, go back to a second appointment because of course you forgot it the first time and show them that indeed you are a veteran. We had another bill come through here that Essentially what it does is when you take a DD-214 to the DMV, they can, you can have that designated on your driver's license. You have proven to a government entity that you do indeed have that form, that you are indeed a veteran. They put that on your driver's license. It seems to me that we ought to be able to take the responsible action of the DMV. Any veteran carrying a driver's license with that V or the veteran written on it should be able to present that and say, yes, indeed, I'm a veteran and not have to present a 214. I did call a, a former county clerk and spoke with her at length about, you know, is there any issues on this, something I'm not seeing. She had nothing from her perspective. She did say, however, that a treasurer, for example, with a veteran's benefit for a reduction in taxes, you have to prove that you were indeed a combat veteran or served in a particular window of time, in which case you still would need to present a DD-214. And on page two, lines five through nine, you will see the parameters for that being set. With that, I think it's a pretty simple explanation of the bill, and I would ask for your favorable consideration. I will stand for any questions. Thank you, Representative Pendergraft. Any questions for the representative? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Representative O'Hearn, Vice Chair O'Hearn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I must be missing something. I haven't carried my DD-214 for about 12 years. And what am I missing that I should be uh, partaking in if I'm be carrying around my DD-214? How often do you, how often are you asked for that? Not Mr. often. Drift? <laughs> Not often, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would say in the 25 years since I have been out, I have presented it maybe five, six times. Um, it's just a convenience, and especially because you don't use it often. A lot of times I've had that cold sinking feeling, okay, I've got to present it. What did I do with it last time? I had it out, did I put it back where it's supposed to be? Um, this is merely a convenience. I cannot cite off the top of my head those events that I used it. Um, if they never come up, they never come up. Any further questions for Representative Pendergraft? Seeing none, thank you so much, Representative Pendergraft. I do see Mr. Shepard. Mr. Shepard, would you like to testify on this bill? Please come forward and introduce yourself to the committee and for the record, and the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, committee. Good afternoon, my name is Tim Shepard. I'm the executive director for the Wyoming Veterans Commission. Uh, speak in favor of this this bill. We think it's. Uh, I do know that uh, we need to hear from YDOT. They've got a couple of proposed amendments which we're in full support of um, to clarify things a little bit. Um, I will. The one thing I will caution with this bill is that um, it it may give veterans the impression that now I just need my driver's license. And I don't need to have my 214 available for the property tax exemption or or whatever else. And that's not necessarily true um, because they they there are there are issues deeper than just I'm a veteran that are covered by the 214 um, periods of service in a combat zone, things like that. So but but the the basic premise of uh, using the V or the veteran designation to uh, 
designate you as a veteran, we, we concur with. Thank you, Mr. Shepard. Any questions for uh, Mr. Shepard? Seeing none, thank you so much. Mr. Rossetti, and looks like Misty may as well. All right, please join us up here at the front. Introduce yourselves again for the record, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Taylor Rossetti, Support Services. Um, I believe Ms. Zimmerman has an amendment that's similar to the one we offered on the other bill um, to include um, the ID cards. And then I believe she's got a, a question of policy for you guys to consider as well. Ms. Zimmerman, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Zimmerman, uh, Driver Services Program Manager. Um, we just would, as looking at this bill, we would like to make it consistent with the 317141 statute in our driver's license section. And on page one, line 14, insert the word or words or driver or identif identification card after the word driver's license. And then that same um, sentiment on page two, line one. Both of the credentials that are issued by the state do have the veteran designation on it. Can you... Um go back to this just so the committee can introduce where that's at. I know you said page one, uh, line 14, and then uh, in that committee, that is after driver's license, that would be, or identification card. And then was that page two, line, line one. one? Thank you. Yes, Mr. Chairman. And then um, in addition to that, Mr. Chairman, the committee may also want to consider introducing the word Wyoming prior to the word driver's license to exclude the use of an out-of-state credential as those credentials are also do get created with um, the veteran designation, but that would be a complete decision by the committee. Wyoming statute does allow, uh, does allow for a person who moves to the state, a commercial driver has 30 days to transfer their driver's license. However, a non-commercial driver does have one year to commit that, to change that over to Wyoming. So just some facts for the committee to make that decision on. Thank you so much, Ms. Zimmerman. Any questions for Ms. Zimmerman or Mr. Rossetti? Don't let them get off this easy. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Sure? Oh, yeah, Representative Berger. Oh, I was good. Never mind. Okay, you guys are good. Um, is that the proposed amendment? Yes, if you would please bring that over to Diana. Uh, committee will get that lined out. Again, we were just told what that is, but uh, we'll have a copy of that as well. Uh, we'll go ahead and open up this for public comment. Uh, Mr. Winnie? Mr. Gill, please go ahead and come on up and we'll just move you right over. Same thing, if anybody's interested, please go ahead and just take up the chairs and rotate them in and out if, as necessary. Mr. Chairman, I support the bill. Uh, some veterans like myself are lucky. I have an ID card that I show. There's enough places that offer veterans discounts and I haul it out and show it to them. And a number of them say, well, you don't have to. But, but the reality is that there's a lot of phonies out there that claim status that aren't. Uh, we had a guy like that out there in uh, the Jackson area in the American Legion turned out to be untrue. At any rate, uh, it gives them a very easy way of demonstrating their status uh, for things like that. And that's, that's I think, very useful uh, because most veterans don't have one of these. You know, they served six years, five years, whatever, and back to civilian life. Uh, but they're veterans nonetheless, and if they have the special status of combat or whatever, I have a son that's spent five years in the Marines, two tours in Iraq, combat status. <clears throat> uh, you know, they'd like to be able to show that, and those guys with combat status, yeah, they should do that. In my case, I was in the submarine world, and I played uh, hide-and-seek with with uh, Russian guys like in Hunt for Red October, but we never actually pulled the trigger. So I guess I can't claim combat status, but but uh, many can, and we ought to honor that. Subject to your questions, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Winnie? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Winnie. Mr. Gill, please introduce yourself. Mr. Chairman, Ken Gill, Laramie County Assessor. Not very often that I get to be in front of this, uh, this committee. Um, I'm in support of this bill. I, I think it's great. I, I'm really glad of the last uh, section in this bill where it says we can still ask for the DD-214 because the veterans exemption that we administer requires certain medals or certain dates. So we will have to have that. So I, I, am, I am 
very happy that that's in there. Just to give you a little story, I've had a, a veteran come in one time and uh, he had his DD-214. He was an older gentleman, had never gotten the exemption in Wyoming. Don't know why, but just never applied for it. He brought in his DD-214, it was in his wallet. This thing was so delicate that I was not going to put it on the, on the document feeder. I ended up putting it on the glass and I made him six copies. He folded them all up and put them all in his wallet. So, <laughs> yeah, that, but I would, I would stand for any questions, Mr. Chairman. Any questions for Mr. Gill? Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Gill. Appreciate your time. Any further public testimony on House Bill 160? Going once, twice, and seeing nobody rushing, we'll close public comment. Committee, what is your pleasure? Bill. Moved by O'Hearn, seconded by Stivar. And committee, let's go ahead and go through this. There was some proposed amendments. Um, I don't think they're they're too controversial, but uh, I'll go ahead and open this up for any motions on amendments. Representative Stivar. I, I move we amend uh, line 14 after driver's license, but an ID card. Or. 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 I wrote an end. <laughs> and then would that also be the same as uh, page two, line one? Yes, sir. Okay, Diana, do you have those? Okay. All right. Any second on the motion? Second. Seconded by O'Hearn. Okay. You want to add we'll take that. Okay. Just a second. Um, committee. Any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none. All those in favor of the amendment, uh, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. That amendment passes. Any further amendments? Representative Nemec. Mr. Chairman. Um, Insert the word Wyoming in front of driver's license on line 14, page one. And also Wyoming, page two, line one, after the word there, insert Wyoming. Second. Seconded by O'Hearn. Any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. That amendment is adopted. Any further amendments? Question. Question being called. Diana, will you please call roll? There we go. Representative Berger? Aye. Representative Nemec? Aye. Representative Obermuller? Aye. Repre Aye. Representative O'Hearn? Aye. Representative Pendergraft? Aye. Representative Smith? Aye. Representative Stivar? Aye. Representative Wiley? Aye. Chairman Brown? Aye. That's nine ayes do pass with amendment. Thank you, Diana. Uh, Representative Pendergraft, I assume you'll be handling this one on the floor. All right. All right. That takes us to House Bill 156. Um, I will go ahead and let everybody know in the room. We do have only about 25 minutes. I suspect this will be a early lengthy discussion. So we will go ahead and introduce the bill, have the discussion. Mr. Lock, uh, Representative Locke, we may not be able to make it through, so we may have to call you back on next week. So uh, Representative Locke, the floor is yours on House Bill 156. Please introduce yourself and feel free to raise that chair. <laughs> <laughs> the floor is yours, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me get, get my info out here. I'm very sorry. <clears throat> well, hopefully it's not too lengthy of a discussion, but it may be. <laughs> um, so the the kind of the objective of this bill was is, was more of a trying to clean up loose ends that were available out there and or that were happening out there. And for example, I know at least in my county in some of the elections. There were cases where uh, expired IDs were allowed to be used and those kinds of things. So the intent of this bill was more just to close reasonable and, and meaningful gaps that made sense, not to create a situation where we, uh, we, we try to cut out a whole class of folks or make voting more difficult. So, so I'll go through the bill and just give you a feel for that. So of course, starting on page two, 
the, the first part of the bill, of course, is all we really add to this section of the existing statute is that the forms of identification cannot be expired. And then we also add in there that it will include a photograph. So those are just two minor additions that we added in there. And that's, you'll see that in page two, lines uh, nine through 11. So that, that's one section. Now you will see an additional paragraph C starting lines 13, again on page two, through lines 23. I, let me see, I don't recall if it, it does not. Um, and, and in there is all I have done is in the cases where people are using, and this was uh, brought to me by uh, some of our election judges and some of the issues, but in the case where IDs don't have a, a, a current and valid um, uh, address, the objective is to just make sure that we have our addresses right when, when individuals are trying to vote. That was the intent of C. And then finally, if you go to page three, there's a repealer for three, uh, three categories um, one of them being student IDs and one being Medicaid or Medicare and Medicaid. Um, after further discussion, I would like to address those a little bit. Uh, after additional discussions with uh, organizations that um, support and, and, and are closer connected with our seniors, I've, I've kind of gotten a tentative amendment to address those. I would remove so I'm going to go ahead and, and speak to those. I would actually remove that um, um, item seven, or you know, the uh, Roman numeral seven, or no eight. Sorry, eight and nine. Those are for um, Medicaid and Medicare IDs. And and so the thinking was that we certainly didn't want to make it difficult for those uh, individuals to be able to vote. We want to make sure we take care of them. And, and some of you probably have some history on this, uh, but I know that that one has actually a sunset clause. So I'm really not looking to change that component of this. After additional discussions with um, this organization supporting them, uh, one of the things that was proposed that one thing that might make that those IDs make use of those IDs better was, was kind of the discussion that maybe we could add to that the ability to um, include, for example. So they would use their uh, Medicare, Medicaid ID, but they, they may have the addition of ver a ver an address verifying piece of documentation as well. It would help bolster it. It would be the type of a utility bill or something like that. So that's some verbiage to that has been added to this, but again, the uh, the amendment that I would propose would be a repealer of that, uh, of uh, getting rid of those repealers. I'm sorry, I want to make sure that's clear because I want to make sure we don't uh, we don't take those out and create issues there that we're we're really not looking to create. So, Representative Stivar, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the question I have is Medicaid and Medicare cards don't have pictures on them. It's just a card that's got their name and their number. There's no picture on it. So how is that gonna fit into your requiring having a photo? Representative Block. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you, Representative Stavar. It That was exactly the conversation. And I fall back a little bit to previous discussions on the, some of these voter IDs where we'll say that agreements that made sense to kind of protect the seniors were, were, were held before. So I, by pulling them out of the repealer, I'm sort of going back to honor previous conversations on these. But those are also, uh, they have a sunset clause, both of them do. So the objective is, of course, to leave those in place. But then what was offered to me as, as a potential recommendation by my another organization that is very close with that uh, group group of people was to add this this capability to include uh, additional verification in the form of 
utility bills or those kinds of things that say, yes, yeah, so this is this individual is, is there. I realize we're not having a photo. So, of course. Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But if it's a senior and they're living with their kids or wherever, nursing home, they don't have utility bills. They don't have them kind of bills. So how is that going to Representative Block. Great question. And I would welcome recommendations on how to address some of those types of issues because I do think we want to be um, respectful to those those items. But I, I would like to look for opportunities that allow them, you know, allow those things to be in place, but at the same time make sure we close holes where, where we can. So I would I would uh, uh, welcome amendments and recommendations in that area. Thank you. Representative Smith. Okay, thank you, Chairman Brown. Um, for the nursing homes uh, capabilities, would they be able to provide their tenants uh, or patients a lease agreement with their address of the care facility to accommodate the address? Representative Locke. I, I would think, I would, I think we would respectfully, we would love to have an amendment like that. I think that would be fantastic. Recommendations on mechanisms we could use that would assist in the verification and at the same time not adversely affect some of the word wording that's already in place. Thank you. Representative Wiley. Hi. Hey, I, uh, I appreciate the sentiment um, of your bill. We want to make sure the folks that are voting are, are who they say they are. But at the same time, we've, we kind of hear some of these concerns. I, I think students, you know, college students could have an issue. I know a lot of folks use PO boxes. Um, and, you know, again, we don't want to take a, a backpack full of documentation to the polls to try to be able to get through and, and get their vote. Is there a question there, Representative White? So how, how, how would you address, yeah, thank you. How would you address the, um, the issue of like PO boxes or, or, you know, students that are traveling around? Representative Luck. I think in many of these cases that I would agree we don't we need a we don't want a backpack. Uh, that being said, I think in most cases there are methods to get uh, address verification and those kind that kind of information available. For example, I think in students' case, one one of the issues with a students' ID is just verifying that they are residents in the state. So there has to be a process to verify that for them to use to verify that even to uh, to choose to vote. So to register to vote. Sorry. So I think with that, with the fact that some of those mechanisms are already in place on the registration side, that we should be able to come up with some mechanisms that are reasonable and convenient for the students or for students and, and the way that they actually register and then ultimately vote. Any further questions for Representative Block? Seeing none, uh, Representative Block, I do have one. Um, I, I have the feeling that this would be uh, potentially making Wyoming have some of the strictest voting uh, laws in the country uh, by requiring not only photo ID, but then by requiring additional documentation to prove addresses. Um, how would you respond to that? not having really fully done a canvas of the other states and where they're at. <clears throat> Most of these, certainly the intent was not to make it difficult, but certainly make it tighter and, and, and increase, increase our election integrity. That was, so if there is a particular area, a particular, some particular verbiage in here that we think crosses a line that concerns us, I certainly am open to uh, suggestions, recommendations. I think I, I strongly uh, stand behind certainly IDs should be valid, right? Uh, expired IDs, which I know are being accepted at points in time, uh, and, and even in the most recent election. I want to make sure we cover those kinds of things. I, I also, because in, in many cases, um, out-of-state driver's licenses can be used as identification, and, and as you can all well guess, um, certainly the address was not right on those. So I do think there needs to be a, a strong mechanism in there, at least in those cases, 
to ensure that uh, address can be verified as well. So those are some of the things I would like to make sure we, we keep in the bill at some level. If there's a particular nuance, again, I'm, I'm open to discussion because again, Mr. Chairman, again, I'm not trying to make it, we want to be careful not to make it difficult for people to vote, of course. Thank you. Representative Berger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So Representative Locke, is even the intent on this bill to try to encourage people instead of day of um, voter ID, uh, let, let's get, get yourself set up ahead of time, kind of like what I do of my children, because my son goes to University of Wyoming, and it was like, no, we're getting you set up. You know, you're here in June. We, got, we did it early so that we made sure he – he could vote. Is that is that an intent there too? Representative Block. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, it definitely is. There is a we, we there is a piece of this tightening up our approach that certainly has that effect. So yes, I would agree with that, Representative. Uh, I I do think that that is very true. Again, not trying to make it hard, but certainly trying to make sure we don't have these little gaps where it doesn't make sense because as you've clearly stated we want to make sure we have a responsible voting population and and uh, and, and then again make sure as in the case of the seniors we take good care of them they, they've been with us a long time we want to make sure we're not uh, you know mistreating them certainly but yes thank you. representative smith please thank you mr chairman uh so the only time you would need additional address verification uh, on a, a lease agreement or a utility bill is if their driver's license or ID does not match an address for the precinct they're trying to vote in, correct? Representative Locke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That is correct. The objective is most of us on our driver's license do have uh, a, 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 an address. And the goal is for you to walk in there, throw that out there, and go in. Now, I know that there are some cases that that may not be the case. Again, uh, the for those for those cases, um, the, for there may be a driver's license uh, that doesn't have that. I'm not specifically aware of one, but for the most part, ours do. And I know it's not always a requirement to maintain it, but if it's not the correct address, as as you go through that process, you know we all we put our ID in they. They sign us off. Part of that is, is your address still valid, right? So if it's on your ID, I certainly don't want to require additional paperwork for any of us. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you, Representative Locke. I would also like to recognize Secretary of State Gray uh, has entered the room. Um, and since we are moving beyond this, rep uh, former representative, Mr. Secretary, if you'd like to speak on behalf of this bill. Please introduce yourself yes. and uh, the floor is yours, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, appreciate it. Uh, for the record, uh, my name is Chuck Gray, Wyoming Secretary of State. And then in a moment, I think Joe Rubino, our, our general counsel general po and our chief policy director will be back. Uh, today, I ask for your support on House Bill 156, which provides increased security, clarity, and uniformity to Wyoming's existing voter ID requirements. Uh, Wyoming's voter ID law holds a special place in my heart, having worked on it uh, for many years and, and continuing to improve that bill every time it was brought. Uh, I couldn't be more excited when it was brought across the finish line and enacted into law. However, as with all things, Wyoming's voter ID law can always be improved so that we may increase the integrity in our election systems processes and help avoid any potential for abuse. Uh, that is why I appreciate Representative Locke's work on House Bill 156 for shoring up many of the loose ends, uh, which I believe were intended to be closed by the legislature when it was originally passed. So I want to run through each, each change with you. First, ensuring the inclusion of a photograph and that identification is not expired. And, and the first change there on page two, lines nine through 11, is specifically on the expiration point. And I would really ask this committee, I know there's some amendments floating, 
uh, to tighten this up a little bit. I do think that is in the batch of things that are on the less controversial end, and I, I would really appreciate being retained uh, in this bill. Then you get on page two, line 13 through 23, which is uh, part C, which requires this uh, address verification if the if the ID uh, is not have a Wyoming address or their current address. And I think this is kind of a beautiful, you know, he, what Representative Locke did, and it was really brilliant, was this concern about other state IDs, which I've heard a lot. Um, it, it provides a way of them to prove their address while still allowing the other state IDs, which is a very common form of identification. And of course, with our YDOT statutes, I believe they have, what is it, a year year to change their ID. Uh, you know, that does create a little bit of, a, uh, of an issue. And, and so I think this is a way, because I hear a lot from people that this other state ID is very concerning, especially when interacting with the weaknesses in our statute regarding residency requirements, which we're going to try to fix in the interim. And we when and the clerks are on totally on board with that. But I think this part C is a really, really good way of of uh, thinking about that, where, you know, that ID is there, but you're confirming that you're from Wyoming and you're living in Wyoming. Um, and, and so would really ask for a due consideration on that one. Then we get to the repealers. So you've got three repealers here, right? which is the student ID, the Medicare, and the Medicaid card. And, and you know, going back to the debate on these, I mean, it, it was a fascinating debate on what should be in there, what isn't. My view as Wyoming Secretary of State, my view at the time was that the student ID, uh, a lot of concerns on that because anybody can receive them. And there are foreign nationals routinely that are students at the university that, that qualify for those legitimately, but it, they wouldn't qualify uh, to vote. And I, I have some concern about those being used uh, at the polls. Now, the other two, you know, we had long conversations with AARP and of course we're in committee. So with the chairman's discretion, I don't think there's an issue with using that, you know, and, and we ended with language. And I really appreciate Mr. Laycock and Mr. Shumway we ended with that sunset language and I've been telling folks, you know, a lot of people are concerned with those being included, but I've been telling folks New Year's Day on 2030, we will have full voter ID uh, with photos and, and um, you know, wherever the committee, I, I personally would support removing them, but I understand there's probably going to be some hesitance in this committee. I do think providing that decade of, uh, of notice, I think is is more than enough. So at the very least, you know, we retain the status quo. Um, and I think this amendment, which Representative Locke prepared, and I don't know if it's before you or not, which sort of builds in this ability for the, the Secretary of State by rule to put some further clarification in the cases of Medicare and Medicaid ID, you know, I I will then engage with the nursing homes, you know, maybe some sort of letter from the head of a nurse, you know, and with the clerks about what that would look like. And I think the, the drafter of the bill put that in as an exception to see if you decide to keep the Medicare and Medicaid cards in, in, in as acceptable voter ID, please retain the sunset. But then we also have some sort of rule where, where uh, we provide some further clarification that that is indeed valid and, and we'd, we'd go through a vigorous process for that. So, you know, there's five or six things in this bill. I think, I think they are on the, the spectrum from, you know, and I would ask you to not throw out the entire bill just because you may fall, you know, on, on you want to keep Medicare and Medicaid ID. And it's my preference to remove that from the list of acceptable voter ID, but I think it's one, it's very important we keep that sunset in there. So at the end of the decade, we have true voter ID, and um, and I do think there are other things in the bill that are very important to retain as well. So thank you. <clears throat> Any questions for Secretary of State? Uh, Mr. Secretary, yeah. I do have one for you, um, and this is just my ignorance on the issue. Yeah. What is the process of obtaining a Medicare Medicaid card? What type of um, background is required to get into those, and is it, I, I would guess it's 
somewhat onerous, but just out of curiosity, uh, are you aware of what that is? And can you lay it out for the committee's understanding yeah. since this is not normally our bailiwick? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, at the time, two years ago, I got pretty into that. I think that is a good question for AARP. You know, every single step of the process, I don't think I'm going to be super uh, helpful on that. I mean, obviously, you need to confirm that you qualify for the program, um, but I'm happy to get you some you know, written documentation, but I also think maybe with Mr. Laycock coming, he can, he can further elucidate and then maybe next week, if maybe you'd be interested in bringing me back up for a few minutes, I'd appreciate it. Yep. If I get some more info. Uh, Mr. Rubino, do you have anything to add beyond what the secretary has added? Nothing. Okay. All right. Committee. Um, oh yes. Representative Luck, uh, please hand it over to the, yep. And make sure you fill out any forms that they need from you. Yep. Um, Committee, we are at 2.16. Um, I hate getting you guys up there just in time to start reading everything. So we are going to just uh, postpone this until next Tuesday. Uh, then we'll then open it up for public comment. Um, and then Mr. Secretary, if you'd like to join us back again. Um, Representative Locke, appreciate you coming down here and we will work this bill uh, next Tuesday. And we are adjourned. <laughs>